Okay, he's up there, I'm down here. Um, hello, good, oh good Lord, there's a lot of you here. Um, well, thank you all for coming. I hope some of the people who were waiting online in the street managed to get squeezed in. Okay. Um, okay, so the, I'm just going to read for, I'm going to read for 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions, and then I'll sit over there and sign books. Um, the Golden House is not a house made of gold. It's, it's, it's a, a house lived in by a family that gives itself the name of Golden, which is not their real name. It's a family that relocates from India to New York. And clearly, at least the, the wicked old patriarch of the family clearly has a very shady past, which, which he's trying to get away from which you might be able to do in real life, but you can't do it in a novel. <laughs> because the novelist will not let you. <laughs> so, I mean, it would be an awful novel, wouldn't it, if I said, this character has a really shady part, but never mind that. <laughs> so, so gradually, that, those secrets come out to get them. And I'm, I'm going to read you just two short passages. One sort of introducing their arrival in, in the city. and. And then another one about how Nero, Nero Golden is the name he gives himself, um, gets snared by, uh, how can I put this, an Eastern European. Uh, he's also in the real estate business. Um, um, but all of this, I have to tell you, was written before anyone else in that business became interesting to us. <laughs> Um, so it's a curious piece of foreshadowing, really. I don't know how I did it quite, but, uh, um, but anyway, here we are. The, the name of that other, that other real estate magnate does not appear in the novel. Um, so I'm just going to read you a, a bit shortly after they first arrive in, in, um, in Greenwich Village, where I don't know if People, if you're familiar with these, this sort of secret garden in the middle of the village between McDougall and Sullivan Street and Bleecker and Houston, there's a sort of little, and, and a lot of the action of the novel takes place almost like a stage set in there, you know, um, and, and the house, the golden house. The golden house actually is one of the few things about the portrait of that bit of the city that is completely imaginary because in fact, all the houses on, on, on the McDougal Sullivan Gardens are exactly the same, built at the same time. Um, but I wanted one to be grander than the others. And, and so I just transplanted a, like an Upper East Side mansion and plopped it down in one corner. Um, and so if you were to go there, the gardens are there, but the thing that isn't there is the Golden House, because um, I made that up. <laughs> What is a good life? What is its opposite? These are questions to which no two men will give the same answers. In these our cowardly times, we deny the grandeur of the universal and assert and glorify our local bigotries, and so we cannot agree on much. In these our degenerate times, men bent on nothing but vainglory and personal gain, hollow, bombastic men for whom nothing is off limits if it advances their petty cause, will claim to be great leaders and benefactors acting in the common good and calling all who oppose them liars, envious, little people, stupid people, and in a precise reversal of the truth, dishonest and corrupt. We are so divided, so hostile to one another, so driven by sanctimony and scorn, so lost in cynicism that we call our pomposity idealism, so disenchanted with our rulers, so willing to jeer at the institutions of our state, that the very word goodness has been emptied of meaning and needs perhaps to be set aside for a time, like all the other poisoned words, spirituality, for example, final solution, for example, and at least when applied to skyscrapers and fried potatoes, freedom. <laughs> but on that cold January day in 2009, when the enigmatic septuagenarian we came to know as Nero Julius Golden arrived in Greenwich Village in a Daimler limousine with three male children and no visible sign of a wife, he at least was firm about how virtue was to be valued and right action distinguished from wrong. 
In my American house, he told his attentive sons in the limousine as it drove them from the airport to their new residence, morality will go by the golden standard. Whether he meant that morality was supremely precious, or that wealth determined morality, or that he personally with his glittering new name would be the only judge of right and wrong, he did not say. It goes on to talk about how the sons had chosen Roman names and, and, they, and, and they had called themselves Goldens. These were not modest men. The youngest of the three, an indolent 22-year-old with hair falling in beautiful cadences to his shoulders and a face like an angry angel, did, however, ask one question. What will we say, he asked his father, when they inquire, where did you come from? The old man's face entered a condition of scarlet vehemence. This I've answered before, he cried. Tell them, screw the identity parade. Tell them we are snakes who shed our skin. Tell them we just moved downtown from Carnegie Hill. Tell them we were born yesterday. Tell them we materialized by magic or arrived from the neighborhood of Alpha Centauri in a spaceship hidden in a comet's tail. Say we are from nowhere or anywhere or somewhere. We are make-believe people, frauds, reinventions, shapeshifters, which is to say, Americans. <laughs> <laughs> Do not tell them the name of the place we left. Never speak it, not the street, not the city, not the country. I do not want to hear those names again. They emerged from the car in the old heart of the village on McDougall Street, a little below Bleecker, near the Italian coffee place from the old days that were still somehow struggling on. And ignoring the honking cars behind them and the outstretched supplicant palm of at least one grubby panhandler, they allowed the limousine to idle in mid-street while they took their time lifting their bags from the trunk. Even the old man insisted on carrying his own valise and carried them to the grand Bozar building on the east side of the street, the former Murray mansion, thereafter to be known as the Golden House. Only the eldest son, the one who didn't like being out of doors, who was wearing, wearing very dark, dark glasses and an anxious expression, appeared to be in a hurry. So they arrived as they intended to remain, independently with a shrugging indifference to the objections of others. The Murray Mansion, grandest of all the buildings on the gardens, had lain largely unoccupied for many years, except for a notably snippy 50-something Italian-American house manager and her equally haughty, though much younger, female assistant and live-in lover. We had often speculated on the owner's identity, but the fierce lady guardians of the building refused to satisfy our curiosity. However, these were years in which many of the world's super-rich bought property for no reason other than to own it and left empty houses lying around the planet like discarded shoes. So we assumed that some Russian oligarch or oil sheikh must be involved and shrugging our shoulders we got used to treating the empty house as if it wasn't there. The McDougall Sullivan Gardens Historic District, to give the gardens their full, overly sonorous name, was the enchanted, fearless space in which we lived and raised our children, a place of happy retreat from the disenchanted, fearful world beyond its borders, and we made no apology for loving it dearly. The original Greek Revival-style homes on McDougall and Sullivan, built in the 1840s, were remodeled in Colonial Revival style in the 1920s by architects working for a certain Mr. William Sloan Coffin, who sold furniture and rugs. And it was at that time that the rear yards were combined to form the communal gardens, bounded to the north by Bleecker Street, to the south by Houston, and reserved for the private use of residents in the houses backing onto them. The Murray Mansion was an oddity in many ways too grand for the gardens, a gracious landmark structure originally built for the prominent banker Franklin Murray and his wife Harriet between 1901 and 1903 by the architectural firm of Hoppin and Cohen, who to make room for it had demolished two of the original houses. As we later learned, Nero Golden had owned it since the early 1890s. Sorry, the early 1980s. <laughs> Ah, oh, all right. It's a long time since I read this. <laughs> it, it had long been whispered around the gardens that the owner came and went, spending perhaps two days a year in the house, but none of us ever saw him. Though sometimes there were lights on in more windows than usual at night, and very rarely a shadow against a blind, so that the local children decided the place was haunted and kept their distance. There was nothing in the house that hinted at their, or at their origins. 
and the four men remained obstinately unwilling to open up about the past. Things leak out, inevitably, and we found out their story in time, but before that, we all had our own hypotheses about their secret history, wrapping our fictions around theirs. Even though they were all fairish of complexion, from the milky pale youngest son to leathery old Nero, it was clear to everyone that they were not conventionally white. Their English was immaculate, British accented, they had almost certainly had Oxbridge educations. And so at first we incorrectly assumed, most of us, that multicultural England was the country that could not be named and London the multiracial town. They might have been Lebanese or Armenian or South Asian Londoners, we hypothesized, or even of Mediterranean European origin, which would explain their Roman fantasies. What dreadful wrong had been done to them there. What awful slights had they endured that they went to such lengths to disown their origins? Well, well, for most of us that was their private affair and we were willing to leave it at that until it was no longer possible to do so. And when that time came, we understood that we had been asking ourselves the wrong questions. That the charade of their newly adopted names worked at all, let alone for two entire presidential terms, that these invented American personae living in their palace of illusions were so unquestioningly accepted by us, their new neighbors and acquaintances, tells us much about America itself and more about the strength of will with which they inhabited their chameleon identities, becoming in all our eyes whatever they said they were. In retrospect, one can only wonder at the vastness of their plan, the intricacy of the details that would have had to be attended to, the passports, the state ID cards, the driver's licenses, the SSNs, the health insurance, the forgeries, the deals, the payoffs, the sheer difficulty of it all, and the fury or perhaps fear that drove the whole magnificent and elaborate cockeyed scheme. As we afterwards learned, the old man had worked on this metamorphosis for perhaps a decade and a half before he put the plan into action. If we had known that, we would have understood that something very large was being concealed. But we did not know. They were simply the self-styled king and his princes living in the architectural jewel of the neighborhood. The truth is that they didn't seem so odd to us. People in America were called all sorts of things. Throughout the phone book, in the days when there were phone books, nomenclatural exoticism ruled. Huckleberry, Dimsdale, Ichabod, Ahab, Fenimore, Portnoy, Drudge. To say nothing of dozens, hundreds, thousands of golds, gold waters, goldsteins, fine golds, gold berries. Americans also constantly decided what they wanted to be called and who they wanted to be shedding their Gats origins to become shirt-owning Gatsby's and pursued dreams called Daisy or perhaps simply America. Samuel Goldfish, another golden boy, became Samuel, became Samuel Goldwyn. The Erzunes became the Vanderbilts. Clemens became Twain. And as many of us as immigrants or our parents or our grandparents had chosen to leave our pasts behind just as the Goldens were now choosing, encouraging our children to speak English, not the old language from the old country, to speak, dress, act, and be American. The old stuff we tucked away in a cellar or discarded or lost. And in our movies and comic books, in the comic books our movies have become, <laughs> Do we not celebrate every day? Do we not honor the idea of the secret identity? Clark Kent, Bruce Wayne, Diana Prince, Bruce Banner, Raven Darkholm, we love you. The secret identity may once have been a French notion, Fantomas the Thief, and also Le Fantôme de l'Opéra, but it has by now put down deep roots in American culture. If our new friends wanted to be Caesars, we were down with that. They had excellent taste, excellent clothes, excellent English, and they were no more eccentric than, say, Bob Dylan or any other sometime local resident. So the Goldens were, were accepted because they were acceptable. They were Americans now. But at last, things began to unravel. These were the causes of their fall. A sibling quarrel, an unexpected metamorphosis, the arrival in the old man's life of a beautiful and determined young woman, a murder, more than one murder, and far away in the country that had no name, finally some decent intelligence work. So that's, that's them. I'm going to tell you about the, what, what did I call her, the, the Russian girl? 
the beautiful and determined young woman. Yeah, all right. All right, so this is a bit later. They've been around for a while. Here is Vasilisa, the Russian girl. She is striking. One might say she is astonishing. She has long, dark hair. Her body is also long and exceptional. She runs marathons and is a fine gymnast, specializing in the ribbon element of rhythmic gymnastics. She says that in her youth, she came close to the Russian Olympics team. She is 28 years old. Her youth was when she was 15. Vasilisa Arsenyeva is her full name. Her region of origin is Siberia, and she claims descent from the great explorer Vladimir Arsenyev himself, who wrote many books about the region, including the one that became a Kurosawa film, Dersu Ozala. But this line of descent is not confirmed because Vasilisa, as we will see, is a brilliant liar, accomplished in the arts of deceit. She says, she was raised in the heart of the forest, the immense taiga forest that covers much of Siberia. And her family was of the tribe Nanai, whose menfolk worked as hunters, trappers, and guides. She was born in the year of the Moscow Summer Olympics. And her heroine, as she grew up, was the great gymnast Nelly Kim, half Korean, half Tatar. 65 countries, including the United States, boycotted those Mo Moscow games. But in the depths of the forest, she was far away from politics, though she did hear about the fall of the Berlin Wall when she was nine years old. She was happy because she had begun to look at a few magazines and wanted to go to America and be adored and send US dollars back to her family at home. This is what she has done. She has flown the coop. Here she is in America, in New York City, and also now and often in Florida. And she is much admired and making money doing the work the beautiful do. Many men desire her, but she is not looking for a mere man. She wants a protector, a czar. Here is Vasilisa. She owns a magic doll. When as a child an earlier Vasilisa was sent by her wicked stepmother to the house of Baba Yaga the witch, who ate children, who lived in the heart of the heart of the forest, it was the magic doll who helped her escape so that she could begin her search for her czar. So the story goes. But there are those who tell it differently, saying that Baba Yaga did eat Vasilisa, gobbled her up the way she gobbled up everyone. And when she did, the ugly old witch acquired all the young girl's beauty, that she became outwardly the spitting image of Vasilisa the fair, though she remained sharp-toothed Baba Yaga on the inside. This is Vasilisa in Miami. She is blonde now. She is about to meet her czar. Anyway, the Golden family goes to Miami for the winter to get away from the weather. And um, they're living on this sort of millionaire's island called Fisher Island off the tip of Miami Beach. And it's New Year's Eve, so there's a party. And at the party, Vasilisa meets Nero Golden. The old man was quite the, the narrator, by the way, is, is a young, I haven't introduced him because he's not really in this bit, but he's a young New York filmmaker. So if you hear the I, that's, that's who's telling, he's called Rene, and that's who's telling the story. The old man was quite the dancer, I discovered. You should have seen him a few years back on his 70th birthday, his son Apu told me, all the pretty girls lining up to take their turns, and he waltzing, tangoing, polkaing, jiving, dipping and twirling them all, joined up dancing, not the disco jigging, strap hanging and pogoing of our degraded time. This is Vasilisa. She is dancing with her czar. She has her arm around him, and this is what her face is saying, I'm never letting go. Taller than he is, she bends down slightly so that her mouth is close to his ear. His ear leans into her mouth to understand what it is telling him. This is Vasilisa. She puts her tongue in his ear. It speaks a wordless language all men can understand. <laughs> Fast forward a couple of days. Here is Vasilisa the Fair giving herself to her czar. 
The first night and the second night, the first two nights of the new year, she demonstrates her wares that seems to be the quality of what's on offer, not only physically and emotionally, but um, here I rear back and halt myself, ashamed, proof-rocked into a sudden pudeur. He gets ashamed, embarrassed about telling the details. But I'm too, in too deeply to stop now, he says. I'm imagining her already, perhaps kneeling beside him on the bed. Yes, kneeling, I think. Asking, is this what you meant? Or this, is this what you meant at all? He is the king, he knows what he wants. And everything you want, she says, when you want it, it's yours. And on the third night, she discusses business. This is not a shock to him. This makes things easier. Business is his comfort zone. She produces a printed card, the size of a postcard, with boxes to tick. Let's go through the details, she says. Obviously, I should not stay in the house on MacDougall. That is your family home for yourself and your sons. And I am not your wife, so I am not your family. So you can choose. A, a residence in the West Village for convenience, for ease of access or B, on the Upper East Side, for a little distance, a little more discretion. Very well, B, this is also my preference. So, the size of the apartment, two bedrooms minimum, no, and maybe one more as art studio space, good. And will I own it, or is it a rental? And if so, for how many years? Okay, think about it. We proceed to the car, and I leave this to you completely. A, Mercedes convertible, B, BMW 6 Series, C, Lexus SUV. Oh, A, so nice, I love you. <laughs> the question arises of where I will have accounts. A, Bergdorf, B, Barneys, C, both of the above. <laughs> Fendi, Gucci, Prada, this goes without saying. Equinox, Soho House, every house, you see the checklist. The subject of a monthly allowance. I must comport myself in a manner that befits you. You see, the categories are 10, 15, 20. I recommend generosity. <laughs> yes, in thousands of dollars, darling. Perfect. You will not regret. I will be perfect for you. I speak English, French, German, Italian, Japanese, Mandarin, and Russian. I ski, water ski, surf, run, and swim. The flexibility of my gymnastic youth, this I retain. In the coming days, I will know better how to satisfy you than you know yourself. And if equipment is needed to assist this, if a room must be constructed, a room for us, let us call it a playroom, I will make sure it is done immaculately and with the greatest discretion. I will never look at another man. No other man will touch me, nor will I tolerate any inappropriate advances or remarks. You deserve and must have exclusivity, and it is yours. This I swear to you. This is all for now, but there is one more matter for later. This is the matter of marriage, she says, lowering her voice to its huskiest and most alluring level. As your wife, I will have honor and standing. Only as your wife will I truly and fully have this. Until then, yes, I am happy. I am the most loyal of women, but my honor is important to me. You understand. Of course, you are the most understanding man I have ever met. So that's how they meet. <laughs> I don't know, have I got time? I just, maybe I'll just read you the, what happens next. Because, of course, she does get married, and then, of course, she wants a baby, which, her, which Nero's other sons very strongly disapprove of. But Rene, Rene appears here. Rene has sort of become friendly with her and gets dragged into her, her plot. Um, Vasilisa asks him to go shopping with her one day. So she's twirling about, trying on fancy clothes. And then they go to have lunch in the restaurant in Bergdorf's. Rene, she says, can I trust you? Really 100% trust you? Because I need to trust somebody and I think there's only you. This, as the old Latin grammar books had it, was a non-a question one which, which expected the answer yes. These being the only questions Vasilisa Golden ever asked. Yes questions. 
would you like to go shopping with me? Do I look okay? Can you zip me up? Do you think the house looks beautiful? Would you like a game of chess? Do you love me? It was impossible to say no, and so of course I said yes, but I admit I metaphorically crossed my fingers behind my back. What a young rat I was. Never mind, in those days I was hard at work. Of course, I said, what is it? She opened her pocketbook and took out a folded letter and passed it across the table to me. Shh, she said. Two sheets of paper from a medical diagnostic laboratory on the Upper West Side. The results of various tests on both Vasilisa and Nero Golden. She took back the page about herself. This isn't important, she said. With me, everything is 100% good. <laughs> I looked at the remaining document in my hand. I, I'm not good at reading these documents, and she must have seen the confusion on my face and leaned in close across the table. It's a seminogram, she hissed. An examination of the seed. Oh. I looked at the various measures and comments. The words meant nothing. Motility, oligozoospermia, nice vitality. What does it say, I murmured. She sighed an exasperated sigh. Were all men this useless, even when discuss discussing material so significant to their manhood? She spoke very quietly, mouthing the words exaggeratedly so that I could understand. It means he is too old to father a child. 99% for sure. Now I understood the strain she was under. She had made her big play and Nero had given in and then this. It's like he did it on purpose, she said in the same very low voice. Except I know he doesn't know. He thinks he's a tiger, a machine. He can make babies just by looking at a woman in the wrong way. This will hit him hard. What will you do? Eat your Caesar, she said. We'll talk after lunch. So then they go walking in the park, and they sit on a table near the carousel. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Vasilisa said. I'm going to protect Nero from this information, and so, by the way, are you. Sit down here. We are going to doctor the form. We were at one of the tables by the carousel. Behind us, the carousel itself was shuttered for the winter. She got out her pen and methodically altered the handwritten figures. Motility, one Roman numeral, she said. That's bad. That means zero motility. And without motility, there is no forward movement, you understand me. <laughs> but if I put a little V after the I, so now it's motility IV4, that's perfect. That's A-OK. -okay. And here, sperm concentration, 5 million per milliliter, very low. But now I put a little 1 before the 5. <laughs> and 15 million, this is normal, according to World Health Organization. <laughs> I looked it up. And so on, here, here, here. Improvement, improvement, improvement. You see, now he's fine. <laughs> now he's totally capable of fatherhood. She actually clapped her hands. The power of the smile of happiness spreading across her face was such that it could almost convince the person upon whom it was unleashed, me, that fiction was fact, that falsifying a diagnosis would actually alter that diagnosis in the real world. <laughs> almost, but not quite. That may take care of his ego, I said, but the baby won't arrive by stork, will it? Of course not, she said. What then, you'll, you'll pretend to go on trying for a while and then persuade him to adopt? Adoption is out of the question, she said. Then I don't understand. I will find a donor, a sperm donor. Yes. How, how will you get him to agree to that if he doesn't know his own sperm isn't working? He will never agree to it, she said. You'll get a sperm donor without telling him? How is that even possible? Aren't there documents that have to be signed? Isn't his con consent necessary? He will never consent. Then how? She reached across the table and took my hands in hers. <laughs> my darling Renee, she said, that is where you come in. <laughs> so, stop. All right, well, yeah, that's, then it gets worse. Uh, so. <laughs>
It's all right, questions. But yeah, over, here, over there, there's two hands up. So as a fine writer and certainly a keen observer of human nature, I wonder if you have a comment about the current occupant of the White House oh. claiming that the free press is the enemy of the people. Oh my, I thought we might have five minutes before we got to him. <laughs> that was awfully quick. Well, you know, you can imagine what my comments are. That the, in, in this novel, there is a moment later on in the novel when, when there's an election campaign and uh, there's a strange figure running for the presidency. W what I felt was that I didn't want his name in the book and, and then it occurred to me that in a deck of cards, you know, there's, there are only two cards that behave badly. And one of them is the Trump and the other is the Joker. <laughs> and I thought, well, I don't want the one, so I'll have the other. So there's a character called the Joker who runs for president. <laughs> Has green hair, very, very white face that he's very proud of. Um, and wins, and wins. And uh, it did strike me, I mean, most of this novel is pretty realistic, really. There's, there's, there's very little in it that one would call magic realism or surrealism or whatever. But there is that one element of this notorious cartoon figure running for president and, and winning. And it just seemed to me that what, I, what the book is trying to say is that, you know, here we are in a real place, having our real lives with our real problems and hopes and so on. But when we rise to the level of, of great power, we are being ruled by grotesques. We are being ruled by comic book figures. Um, and, and I wrote all of that before it happened. And now it's worse than I thought, <laughs> you know. Um, and it's one of the strange things that almost all of this book was written before the election. Um, I mean, I knew that if the election had gone the other way, I would have to do some tweaking, but, but there really wasn't a whole lot that was needed. And the strange thing is that all the time that I was writing it, I thought and hoped that the other thing was going to happen. Um, but the book knew better than I did. The book, the momentum of the book was relentless in the direction of, of what did happen. And I think it's just one of those moments, I was saying to somebody on the radio yesterday, that when you realize that the, that the work of art can be wiser than the artist. You know? And, and um, I think somehow the book knew something that I didn't know, you know? or that I was trying not to know. You know? Uh, there was a moment when I thought it was gonna happen, where I was in, I was in a taxi here somewhere, and a Sikh taxi driver who told me that he was going to vote for Trump. And I said to him, no, excuse me, I see that your name is Jaswinder Singh, you know, and just, there's a wild guess, you probably come from the Punjab. <laughs> and and he, said, he said, yes, sir, Jalandar said here. I said, oh, well, that's interesting, I've been there. And, and I said, you know, I come from Bombay, and, and you realize that this, this, this individual doesn't like people like you and me coming to this country. And um, so why would you vote for him? And he said, oh, sir, Mr. Trump, straight shooter, says what he thinks doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> and, and I thought, oh, we're going to lose. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, I do think the serious part of your question about the, about the freedom of the press, I do think there is an attack on the First Amendment in this country such as I've never seen and never hoped to see. You know? um, and remember that the First Amendment has two parts. One part is to, is to protect the freedom of speech. And yes, the attack on journalism is, is an aspect of how that's being attacked. But the other part of the First Amendment protects freedom of religion. Um, and we've just seen today in the Trump Supreme Court, um, an attack on that part of the First Amendment, which is just as worrying. You know? So, yeah, bad times, vote in November. <laughs> now let's talk about somebody else. <laughs> yeah, right. Mr. yeah, the other one there. Mr. Rushdie, I really enjoy your books so much. Um, they're very complicated in plot and beautiful in language. And I wonder which writers you admire and who has influenced you in your writing? Well, that's a very long list, right? You know, I, because I think, I do think that most writers that I know are, are really very big readers. 
you know, and and uh, and that therefore they love a lot of books, you know, and 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 they draw on. I remember there's a s story I read about how when William Faulkner published As I Lay Dying with its multiple narrators, somebody accused him of having plagiarized that idea from another novel. And he gave the most wonderful Faulknerian answer. He said, when I am in the throes of my genius, <laughs> he said, I take whatever I need from wherever I can find it. And, and I don't know any writer who would do differently. And he's right. I mean, I think most of us would not talk about the throes of our genius, but, but, but the rest of it, I think, is true. That writers draw on everything all the time, you know. And, and um, in this book, one of the writers that, I mean, in order to prepare for this book, I did read a number of, of kind of realistic novels set in New York City. So I, so I read, you know, Washington Square, and I read The Age of Innocence, and, and, and I read, um, you know, Baldwin's Another Country, which is actually set in the same neighborhood as, 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 this, as my book. And that was good preparation, you know. And, but really, I suppose the writer that's most significant for me in this book is Dickens, because I think there's a thing that Dickens does which, which the book tries to do, which is that the world of Dickens's fiction is incredibly realistic. I mean, it's, it's sort of hyper-realistic. Um, but the, the characters he projects against that world are somewhat larger than life, a little bit exaggerated. They're, Rene, in, at one point in the novel, when talks about the kind of movie he wants to make, and he describes the style of that movie as operatic realism. You know, and, and I think the, that's in a little bit what the book's trying to do. It's trying to have some of that, the characters have some of that enlargement that characters have in grand opera, you know, but, but set against a world which is completely credible, I hope. You know, so, so yeah, Dickens, I guess, would, would be the most significant. Yeah, so here, yeah, where's the microphone? Yeah, coming up, yeah. Hello, Mr. Rajni. Uh, you named your character with a stereotypical name from Russian fairy tales, who is sometimes as Elise as the fair, sometimes as Elise as the wise. I'm just wondering, were you influenced by Russian fairy tales when you were writing it? And if yes, which ones? Well, I mean, yes, I was influenced by the story of Baba Yaga because, because I've obviously used it quite directly and then sort of made up some of it. Some of, some of the Baba Yaga in my book is not, is not really in the folklore. Um, but I mean, I remember, I mean, I wanted her to come from Siberia, and so I was thinking about Siberia, and that made me think of the, of the Kurosawa film, Der Suozala, which, which I loved when I saw it. And then I wanted to find out about, you know, Arseniev, who, so, so I gave, gave her the imaginary parentage of having come from, from Arseniev. And, um, and then I was reading about the literature of that area, and, and then realized that, that that's the kind of where the Baba Yaga stories are set. And so it all seemed to come together and fit. You know? I and mean, if you're going to make a Russian character, she may as well have some Russian fairy tale in her, you know? <laughs> especially a really wicked one like that. <laughs> so. Anyone at the back, near the back? I can't see. There's, yeah, over there, hand waving. To preempt any heartache, I don't think we're going to have time for everybody, but we're going to try. Yeah. Mr. Rushdie, you've given me great, great pleasure. So permit me a s perhaps borderline impertinent question, or perhaps trivial. I've noticed and come to expect uh, fem major female characters to be of exceptional good looks in your novels. <laughs> and I wonder if this is part fantasy, um, if I, I don't, I'm, perhaps I'm asking you to analyze yourself, uh, but it, there seems to be a statistical. Um, um, to, oh, thank you. No, I mean, someone no. else has noticed this too. I mean, and I can, my I, feminist I, friends would say maybe he's guilty of looksism. You know, I'm guilty of a lot of things, <laughs> <laughs> and, and have been blamed for a lot more things that I'm not guilty of. So, so at this point, I don't care. <laughs> um, put it like this, the, the person in this, that character is not presented, how shall I put it, appealingly. You know, and, and, it's, and it's about the power of beauty and how it can be misused. Uh, no, I've written other books, yes, but I mean, if you, if you, if you, 
<laughs> I mean, if you want to go through all the characters in all the novels, you will notice that most of them, are, I mean, you know, Midnight's Children has a large number of female characters, most of whom are not defined as beautiful, you know, um, and so does Shame, and, and so does the Satanic Verses, and so on. So, you know, sometimes they're pretty, sometimes they're not. This is like life, right? <laughs> If you're lucky, they're pretty more of the time than that they're not pretty. <laughs> um, yeah, that's as much as I'm going to say <laughs> on that subject. Uh, yeah. All right. Hi, Mr. Rushi. Yeah. I'm, I'm here with my whole writing class. We all oh. came together. Oh. <laughs> the whole Hi, row. writing class. <laughs> and, uh, and we're all in various stages of our writing career or wannabe writing career. And uh, so my question for you is, can you share a moment with us when you were rejected? Yeah. Um, and maybe give us, uh, what was your most horrible where, where rejection? The, where, sorry, where is the writing class at? Well, we were, we were at New School, and, oh, then, we, okay. and then we decided to continue on our own oh, together. Cool. All right. so. Well, no, look, I mean, I had a really difficult start as a writer. You know, what it, I mean, the, the, in my generation, I was living in London at the time, and in my generation, there were a lot of my contemporaries who sort of took off like a rocket, you know? I mean, there were writers like, uh, like Martin Amis and Ian McEwan who, who had their first books in their early 20s that were enormously successful and well-received and boom, off they went. And that didn't happen to me. You know, I, I, um, I, had, I wrote a lot of books that nobody, I, mean, I wrote a novel that was so bad that it didn't even get me a bad agent. <laughs> um, and, then I wrote another one that I didn't like and I didn't show it to anybody. Then I wrote one that was published and everybody hated it except Ursula Le Guin, for which I've always was extremely grateful to her all, all her life and fortunately was able to tell her so. Um, then I wrote another one that I didn't like and didn't show anybody. So by, the, you know, by this time, I was getting on. You know, I, mean, I, left, I, left, I left university when I was 21 and I started writing what became Midnight's Children um, in, you know, by, when, by the time I started writing that, I was 28. And by the time I finished that, I was 33. And at that point, I had had absolutely no success as a writer at all. Um, and was having to make a living writing advertising and just wondered whether I was just like everybody else in creative departments and ad agencies, because they all think they've got a novel in the bottom drawer or a, or a TV series or a movie script or something, you know, and they're all hoping that that thing will get them out of the prison of the ad agency into their real life. And I thought, well, maybe I'm just one of them, you know? And so there was, a, when Midnight Children was finished, there was an enormous amount riding on it, because I really thought, when I finished it, I thought, you know, it seems good to me. But, may, but I, maybe I don't know what good is, you know? And, and maybe and if nobody else agrees, then maybe I should just stop. And, and fortunately, that wasn't how it went. But, but it meant that, you know, by the time I felt that I knew what I was doing as a writer, I was 34 years old, you know? And it, it took me 13 years um, of struggle and, and uncertainty and real self-doubt. You know, and, and actually, I, now I look back at that young self, and I'm kind of proud of him, you know, that he had the determination to keep going until he learned how to do it. You know? and, and if somebody told me now, how would you like to spend 13 years of your life doing something extremely difficult without any guarantee that you'll ever be any good at it? You know? <laughs> I would say, well, probably not. <laughs> you know? but, but, that's, that's how it started with me, you know, and so by the time, uh, by the time 1981 came around and Midnight's Children was published, you know, I'd, I felt that I'd really paid my dues, you know, and then everybody said I was an overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was a long night. <laughs> so, uh, thanks. How much time do we have? We have time for a couple more? Four more. Okay. All right. One. Missed. Oh. Yeah. Oh. We have one over here and then some at the back. So in the back? Yeah, one from the back, and then we'll come up here. There you go. Um, 
I was wondering if uh, you have a favorite recipe or recipes from Indian cookery. Oh. Uh, and like, if you cook yourself. Mm. Oh, well, thank you. This is, my sister wrote a wonderful cookbook uh, called, which has just been, uh, it was published in England 30 years ago, but at, at, at that time, people here weren't so interested in Indian food. And, um, and now it's been published as a kind of classic cookbook. Um, and it's just out. Please buy it. Sameen Rushdie's Indian cookery. Really good. I'm sure they have copies here. Um, uh, with an introduction by me. Uh, this time, the first time round, she was so proud that she didn't want to trade off my name that she refused to allow me to have anything to do with the book and she didn't mention me in it, um, even though I did a lot of work. <laughs> it is, <laughs> which is that, I mean, essentially a lot of the book tries to, rep to reproduce the tastes of our mother's kitchen, really. And that's, it's, it's supposed to try, it's try and be our home cooking. You know, and, and, um, and she talked to my mother a lot about, about recipes and cooking and so on, and, um, and then tried to replicate it in a written down recipe form so that other people can repeat it. You know? and, and because I was really the only other person who knew how the food should taste. And so I became the, the eater. <laughs> but she, what she said to me is just follow the recipe exactly and then tell me if it tastes right. You know, and so I did, and sometimes I would say, yes, it does, and sometimes I would say, you know, a little more of this, less of that. So, so I, yeah, I was quite involved in the, I wasn't, I mean, I didn't do any of the writing, but I did do some of the eating. <laughs> and, and she kept complaining. All the time she was writing the book, she would call me up and blame me. She said, she said, she said you don't understand. You, why did you make me do this? Because it's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, well, I said, when did I say that writing books was easy? <laughs> I don't remember saying, anyway, so I got, the, I got beaten up as well. So I feel quite proprietorial about the book. But no, it's all her own work. And it's, the one thing I can say is that the recipes really work. It's a really good cookbook. And people in England who've used it have, you know, swear by it. I mean, it's, it's, you know, the, the British food writer Nigella Lawson is quoted on the book saying that she loves the book and she, I know that she's been using it and recommending it for years. And the wonderful novelist Kamala Shamsi, who just won the Women's Prize in, in England, she says that three generations of her family have sworn by the book um, and so on. You know, it's a good book and not by me. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we have some more from in We've front. We've got here. another one back here. All right. You have one more back yeah. there and then two in the front. My heart is beating so hard. I can't believe I'm actually addressing you. I'm sorry. Um, my colleague and I, for some time, have, um, in, in middle school, been teaching Harun and the Sea of Stories as yeah. a central text um, because it's such a beautiful, lyrical introduction to close reading and interpretation and, and just what good writing looks like. And it never occurred to me that I would have the opportunity to say this to you. But for years, my students have been saying to me, I wish Mr. Rushdie would tell us what he meant, which is to say, is it a dream? Is it Rashid's tale? Is it a framing with story within a story? Is it all of those things? And I, of course, always tell them that they get to make the meaning, but they want to know what you think. <laughs> I think it's all completely true. I think it all happened. You know, I mean, I, I don't think it's just a dream. I think that's one of the great cop-outs of The Wizard of Oz. You know? <laughs> um, um, no, it's not a fucking dream. <laughs> Tell him <them> that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. Let's have some. Uh, there were some hands up in the front here. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, I'm from Trinidad. And when you mentioned uh, Dickens a little while ago, the, uh, it brought to mind V.S. Naipaul. And I was wondering, have you ever met him? And what did you think? Yeah, I, I met, yeah, I mean, I don't know him very well. You know, we, we've, we move in rather different circles. And, and uh, I've met him a few times. And we've had our disagreements. You know, I mean, our, I mean, our politics are very different. Um, I mean, his... His support for the BJP in India is clearly not something that I would agree with. Um, I mean, he's a wonderful writer, you know. He's a wonderful writer that I disagree with about a lot of things. And I have to tell you, there was a, when I had first moved to New York so 18, 19 years ago, in the winter, I was walking somewhere in Midtown, and this 
Indian gentleman, very, very well dressed Indian gentleman, a camel coat, very nice hat, came walking up to me and he stopped me and he asked me if I was me. And I said, yes, I was me. And he said, he said I just want to tell you that V.S. Naipaul is 10 times as good a writer as you. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I, sa I said, well, then you should be very pleased because now you've told me. And, and he said, yes, I just wanted you to know. <laughs> and then he walked off. <laughs> I just stood there laughing. It was the most wonderful moment. <laughs> anyway, you know, Vidya Naipaul is, a, you know, he's, he's now old and frail. There was a moment when he wrote some extraordinary books. Uh, you know, House for Mr. Biswas, Bend in the River. There are some extraordinary books there. Uh, and some that I don't like, but that's okay. Yeah. How many, well, let's have one more, lady in the white shirt, because you've been putting up your hand for a long time. Yeah. Mr. Rashti, I love all your books. Let me say that right at the very beginning. And I loved uh, Midnight's Children, which I read a long time ago when I was a young girl. And then I've read it recently again, and I loved it even more. I just wanted to know that was such beautiful, magical realism, what was in the book. It was leaping between, you know, one to the other, one to the other. Yeah. The first time I read it, I didn't understand it fully. Second time I did, I would believe that I understood it a little better than I did the first time. Uh, I would just like to know what made you go away from that genre and into this. Oh. Well, I mean, the answer to that is is that sometimes I do it and sometimes I don't. You know, I mean, that it, that it seems to me that you don't have to just write one kind of book. You know, you 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 find you find the techniques and manners that are relevant for the story you're trying to tell. You know, and 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 that's what does it. But I'm going to just conclude by telling you a story story which is quite relevant to what you just said about when Midnight's Children came out. I was in India doing a little tour. And I was in Delhi at JNU University and, and having an event like this. And a young woman, I guess a student, stood up in the Q&A and, and said, Mr. Rushdie, your novel, Midnight's Children, very long novel. <laughs> she said, said, never mind, I read it through. <laughs> she said, and my question for you is the following. Fundamentally, what's your point? <laughs> And I sort of opened my mouth and she said, no, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> I said, really? She said, yes, you're going to say that the whole novel from page one to page 550 is your point. Isn't that what you're going to say? And I said, well, actually, that is something like what I was going to say. <laughs> and she said, it won't do. <laughs> and ever since then, I've been trying to work out the answer to that question. <laughs> And I really st I still don't know fundamentally what's my point. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>